Much like the small Corsican was when he invaded Russia, many brilliant filmmakers have attempted to tackle the life of Napoleon Bonaparte but have been frustrated by the sheer size of the undertaking. In a way, Sir Ridley Scott is also beaten, along with Charlie Chaplin and Stanley Kubrick. His most recent epic has a lot of enjoyable aspect. The film features some very breathtaking fighting sequences, and Vanessa Kirby plays the sly Josephine, Napoleon's second greatest love after himself. Nevertheless, even after two and a half hours, Joaquin Phoenix's mysterious, mumbling portrayal in the title part has you wondering precisely what makes Napoleon. It's clear that he is a military prodigy. We understand his impression and it becomes clear from moments of strange psychosexual intensity that he is enthralled with his seductively seductive, unquestionably immoral wife. Beyond all of that, though, he appears to be an oddly vacant vessel for David Scarpa's erratic screenplay, which places a few phrases in his mouth that cars the crowd to chuckle aloud yesterday. You think your boats make you so great, he sneers at an English ambassador. For less, Whiny kids have been banished to the mischievous death. You have to choose your battles, as anyone with small children can attest to. Scott chooses his carefully. Though Napoleon orchestrated over 60 triumphs, his losses in combat are what matter most, especially on the side of the channel, where there are noticeably no railroad stations named Austerlitz. His most devastating losses were in 1815 at Waterloo, which is given a full blood and thunder treatment in this picture starring Rupert Everett as the magnificently haughty Duke of Wellin. These losses also occurred during his disastrous Russian campaign. The story opens in the aftermath of the French Revolution, with Napoleon then only a young, nameless soldier watching Queen Marie Antoinette's death from the crowd. He soon demonstrates his tactical prowess and bravery on a personal level by crushing the English at the Siege of Toulon. It seems uncomfortably true I'm not sure how accurate it is that the English troops were completely overwhelmed at the time of that attack. In contrast, there are many other times when they don't. Anticipating a strong reaction from some academics, probably sparked by Scott's remark, when I have problems with historians, I ask excuse me, mate, were you there? Not at all. All right, then shut the asterisk 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 up. That's all very well, but considering that the French are only a quarter of a mile away and that, as far as I know, no long-range sniper rifle has been produced, an English officer spotting Napoleon in his sights at Waterloo is another belly laugh inducing mine. Nevertheless, historical accuracy and cinematic epics have seldom been more than passing acquaintances. Even though Napoleon's passion for Josephine doesn't seem to be driven by anything other than unbridled lust, Scott's film does at least attempt to explain. This gets worse when he finds out that she's taken a lover while on one of his far-off campaigns. In fact, she continues to harass him from a distance even after he annuls their marriage due to her inability to bear him an heir, continuing with the Russian Tsar, no less. Still, is it really possible that her extramarital affairs were revealed in a newspaper under the story Boney's Old Bird caught out of the nest in? If that's a dramatic license, it ought to be cancelled right away. The fact that this film will have over an hour of new content when it hits the tiny screen might make it easier for us to understand how multifaceted Napoleon's character is. But in terms of epics, Scott and Phoenix collaborated considerably more successfully in the fantastic Gladiator, which came out 23 years ago. Though it's not by much, I give this one a thumbs down. Napoleon debuts on November 22 in theaters and subsequently airs on Apple TV+.